The Nintendo Entertainment System. It may not have been as popular in Europe as it was in the States, but that didn't prevent it from being a thing of intrigue, wonder and excitement. If anything, it made it seem more intriguing, wondrous and exciting. And it is an intriguing thing, I mean look at this corner shaped flap, just waiting to devour a cartridge into the belly of the beast. Its aesthetics deviate hugely from the original Japanese Nintendo Famicom, just as much as it deviates from the design of Sega's Master System, but it does so in such a pleasing way. Even the controllers are lust worthy in their own simple rectangular way. But the NES really is a box full of secrets, as well as two bespoke controller ports on the front and standard power in and RF connections on the back, the side reveals a composite output which was fairly special at the time. But it's underneath where things really start to get interesting. At first glance you might see nothing particularly of interest, but then this rectangle in the middle might start to seem a little odd and the fact that there are gullies running away from it further increases curiosity. Now reportedly on early NES units you just get this plastic block, but on later ones there's actually a plastic tab underneath as well which needs to be physically snapped off. I can only presume that Nintendo got sick of kids discovering what was underneath and ramming stuff in, potentially causing short circuits and the like, because once you get in, you reveal this wonder. Now a rumour of the time was that this port was a secret connection designed to accept Master System cartridges, so NES owners didn't have to miss out on all those incredible Sega releases. Well, in Europe maybe at least. Well, it doesn't take many IQ points to assume that this is indeed a pile of utter shash. The NES doesn't contain nearly the right hardware to facilitate that, let alone all the legal, marketing and really common sense issues that it would produce. But the edge connector itself is roughly the right size, so you can see what people were thinking. What makes more sense is foresight, a powerful skill that can be far more useful than hindsight. You see, the Famicom released several years prior in Japan was not too dissimilar. Although lacking joypad connections on account of them being permanently wired in, it did have a male 15 pin port on the front. This port was used for peripherals such as light guns, 3D glasses and additional controllers. Of course, the Famicom had other expansions such as a modem and disc system, but these connected directly via the cartridge slot. This was both practical and in any case the expansion connector wasn't geared up to accept them. Will you be the one to witness the birth of the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? So along comes the NES onto North American shores in 1985, and as we know it was a very different beast. With the American video game crash of 1983, Nintendo had a lot riding on their console. They also had a lot of fear. Both Atari and Coleco had tried to move their consoles away from being toys so they could be established as a necessary part of your home entertainment setup, but Nintendo went one further by actually making their appropriately named entertainment system resemble a video cassette recorder, which was a booming product at the time. Of course, this meant that it would be far more difficult to add things like a disc system or modem if required in the future, and so the solution was a much more capable 48 pin expansion port, this time located on the bottom. These cutout chunks are of course for securing any peripherals securely to the base or for running wires out of the side. And when I say capable, this thing really was wired up to take over joystick connections, audio lines, direct CPU connections, and even had direct connections to cartridge pins. At the time of its creation, the idea by Nintendo president Minaru Arakawa was to introduce as many peripherals for the NES as they had and were still intending to for the Famicom. 
so all we need now are those peripherals. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be, well, any peripherals which were made to take advantage of this capable slot, except maybe for one. In 1987, Nintendo held a tournament based around the Famicom disc game Mario Open Golf. To compete, you'd simply take your disc to a disc fax machine and submit scores directly to Nintendo. This not only introduced a lot of people to the concept of online gaming, but it set the seed for creating the Famicom network system the following year. By purchasing a Famicom modem, users could access a server providing game cheats, jokes, weather forecasts, stock trading, and even horse betting. Although novel, it wasn't a great success, particularly the services designed for adults, and only 130,000 modems were sold. But Hiroshi Yamauchi didn't see this as a failure, instead he saw America as the true testing ground, a testing ground which had an NES in about 30% of homes, leading them to predict a connection rate of 10 million homes by the end of 1991. That's a big number. To assist with this, Jerry Ruttenberg, the vice president at HBO, was brought in by Nintendo of America to set up a network and working with AT&T, developed a data terminal cartridge for the NES based on a Super Mario Bros. style interface. However, the idea fell flat, and it was for pretty much the same reasons of adults unwilling to conduct online business on what was essentially their kid's toy. But this wasn't their final attempt. Building on existing hardware, Control Data Corporation enlisted Nintendo to set up an online lottery test. 10,000 residents of Minnesota received free kits to test this modem with their NES. You can see where it slots directly into the expansion port, and would sit seamlessly under the console. The idea was, for $10 a month, you could connect up to the Minnesota Lottery, buy your tickets, and even check your winnings. But this time the problems weren't with use, they were with the State Attorney General laying siege to gambling being conducted on a device which was marketed to children. The safeguards in place to prevent minors from gambling were seen as easy to circumnavigate, and the idea of an NES modem was almost put to rest. I say almost because Keith Rupp and Nolan Bushnell would try one last time with the Teleplay modem under the company name Baton Technologies. The premise here was a cross-platform gaming network between Sega and Nintendo systems, and maybe this is where the original being able to play Sega games on your NES console myth originated from. In any case, Sega and Nintendo both refused to license the technology, and the dream quickly died away leaving us with our vacant expansion slot. Talking about vacant, if your mind is feeling vacant, then how about checking out this video's sponsor, Brilliant, a problem-solving treasure trove of discovery. I've spoken about Brilliant before, but there's really so much on offer here that I could keep going for a while. How about programming with Python? Brilliant breaks everything down into incredibly easy steps, so it's both easy and fun to digest. Or maybe probability fundamentals. You can delve into casino probabilities and learn how to beat the house, make gambling a bit safer. Seriously, I can't praise it enough. I've been really enjoying and learning a lot from all the courses on offer here. Go to brilliant.org slash nerd to sign up for free with the first 200 people getting 20% off their annual premium membership. So the art of foresight is useful, but sometimes you just don't need what you put in, although arguably it's still always far better to put it in than keep it out. But fast forward to 2015 and we get this. Now, this may look like a perfectly innocuous tweet, but it was actually sent directly from an NES. This fine gent, Trapper McFerron, actually made use of the expansion port to connect up with my favourite social network. I suggest you go and check out his video if you want to find out more on that. 
There's also a nice little hack where if you solder a resistor between pins 3 and 9 of the connector, you can reclaim the expansion audio found in the Famicom, but which was removed from the NES. This was a feature where some Famicom games actually contained audio circuitry and added it into the Famicom's standard audio mix. So not really useful for NES games, but handy if you're running any Famicom games through your NES. Back in 2012, there was actually a mod created known as the Enio EXP board that did this for you and converted the NES expansion port to the same as the Famicom, allowing you to use accessories such as those 3D glasses or keyboard. Pretty neat, although quite hard to get hold of these days. And of course, it should be noted that the top loader NES does not feature the expansion. By the time that was created, Nintendo of America realised it was now redundant. But that wasn't the end for Nintendo's expansion dreams. Of course, this is a legacy that would continue with future Nintendo consoles, from the EXT ports found on the SNES and N64 to the serial and high-speed connectors found on the GameCube. Nintendo always wanted to make sure there was enough upgrade options for their consoles. But unlike Sega's consoles, which tended to employ edge connector expansions, sadly we didn't get to see most of the fruits of Nintendo's expansion dreams, especially in the West. But it's still nice to think of what could have been. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great evening.